It empowers people. Do we collectively see each other's humanity? Rights, citizenship, the right to vote, it's never been granted. It's always been. We have to dive into the deep with facets of our past, both the wonderful parts of it and the ugly parts of it. Children, my children, I'm losing you. Ten million of you will survive those slave ships. All of you will struggle. And because of your resilience, you will have triumph too. But I promise you, we'll find each other again. Hello, I'm Hope Wright, and I'm here today with Deborah Canty Downs and Jeremy Morris. We've gathered to talk about how we educate about and discuss black history in the present. Everyone here teaches history in different ways. Now, I'm an actor interpreter, and I portray free and enslaved black women who lived in and around Williamsburg better than 200 years ago. Um, I perform in scripted scenes and, and plays. Um, but I also portray these women um, out on the streets of Colonial Williamsburg and I'm prepared to answer any and every question that our guests may have about these women. Now, Jeremy, we work together. Can you talk a bit about your approach to teaching history? Um, it's kind of uh, just like you described. Um, I do the same thing. So uh, day in and day out, you know, we uh, field the questions that people bring uh, with them to this this educational institution, right? Like they to to learn more about the beginnings of our history. So what we do is we take um, our research of primary uh, source documents, um, newspapers, letters, um, court records, all those kinds of things. Um, we read between the lines of these things oftentimes when um you know with the work that we do i often describe it as a double-edged sword because compared to uh many of our counterparts our white counterparts um who portray in the big names that everybody thinks of when they think about the revolutionary period your washington your lees everything like that um the the information that we have a lot of the time is very scant mm -hmm. and so um, we have to do a lot with very little, comparatively speaking. Mm -hmm. So in that, we're going through our articles, we're going through the Gazette, um, and looking at the self-liberation ads, we're looking mm -hmm. at these um, uh, notices of people who are vacating, people who are just selling off property, and of course at this time in the 18th century, people fall under those categories under the laws that were written. Mm -hmm. When we're able to put all of that together, we are able to paint a picture, you know, and as accurate as we're able um, to bring to life this this very seldom examined and very seldom and, and analyzed, um, I should say, um, piece of history, the piece of our truth, yeah. of, our, of our country. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, now, Deborah, you work with students and teachers. Can you tell us a little bit about what you do? Um, I teach kindergarten, but I am also responsible in the summertime for working for Teacher Institute here at Colonial Williamsburg. And to be honest, my job is really contextualization, mm -hmm. um, to be able to take the concepts that are here in a museum a mile long and mm -hmm. half a mile wide, and then bring them back to a 12 by 12 space to help people understand and also to work through the challenges and triumphs of the lives of Virginians in Williamsburg during the 18th century. And so um, with talking about those challenges and also talking to teachers about how they can talk about the African-American lives in Williamsburg and to bring those lives to life in their classroom. Mm -hmm. Also to be able to engage in many different types of constructs to bring their children to a point of what we call historical empathy, being able to understand 
how these people must have felt mm -hmm. and to see how their place in history can be challenging, it can be diff difficult, it can be rewarding, but to make sure that our teachers and our students understand about those who came before, those our ancestors who walked the streets here, not only in Williamsburg, but all over the state of Virginia. I cannot say what tribe I am from. All I can say is I'm black and you can shout out that you're German, Italian, and Irish. I do not know my native tongue and every time I hear a Nigerian or Haitian speak theirs, I rage with envy. See, I do not know anything about where I am from. Now we've all chosen to teach a complicated history. What compels you to tell these stories and to teach this history? When I went through school, there were so many times that we didn't talk about these things. They were not things that you talked about in the classroom. We have a paragraph on slavery in the 18th century. You discuss a little bit about what happens in the Civil War, and then you go through Reconstruction. You go through these pieces of history, and time marches on, but there is no conversation about how people of color are represented in that march of time and how a lot of the history and the hardships of African Americans during that time gets glossed over mm -hmm. and almost mm -hmm. ignored to the point of their lives are not important until we get to the point of civil rights. And then all of a sudden Africans are brought, African Americans are brought back into the narrative. Mm -hmm. And then that's when we want to talk about African Americans and African Americans have done this and they've done this and they've done this and they've done this. And then it seems like once we're done studying the civil rights period, again, African Americans slip out of that narrative and they are blended in almost you know, neither seen nor heard. Mm -hmm. And I mm -hmm. teach this history because I want all of my students to see themselves reflected in every time period of mm -hmm. American history because they are part of that fabric. Mm -hmm. They are creating American history in the present. People may say, well, studying the lives of these individuals who were not as we consider to be the founding fathers, those who established what we are today. No, every person mm -hmm. who took part in this history, regardless of what century it is, they are relevant and they need to be heard and it's gone too long mm -hmm. where folks are left out of major parts of the history because other folks find it difficult to discuss their interaction with those folks during particular times of history. Mm -hmm. What about you, Jeremy? It's like she said, one of, mm -hmm. uh, one of the main things that we can always come back to is a lack mm -hmm. of... Uh, mm -hmm of the information, a lack of being taught um, in the same way that other things are taught. That something is not given the same gravity, it's not given the same weight, right? Like mm -hmm. you, you have a whole unit on the Revolutionary War, but none of it pertains to the, uh, uh, the people that were owned by the men in that room who mm -hmm. signed the declaration. Mm -hmm. None of it is given to the people who were carriaging these men back and forth. None of it is given to mentionings of um, the, how the laws might need to change, yes. how the laws might need to morph and mm -hmm. adapt to this new concept of freedom, of liberty, right? Who gets to hear those words? Who gets to say them? who gets to actually live that life, mm -hmm. you know, those things are not um, highlighted in the same way. And so even if it is dealt with, it's still treated as though it's not necessary for you to be able to say that you understand mm -hmm. what transpired during mm -hmm. these years, during these crucial moments, right? So it's by omission mm -hmm. that it's been shown to us not quite as important. It's not quite as dire that you know the name Billy Lee, that you know the name Roger, that you mm -hmm. know the name Elizabeth De Rosario, mm -hmm. that you know the name Edith Cumbo. It's not quite as important mm -hmm. that you know any of those people 
as it is that you know the certain people that we all can call to our minds, right? Mm -hmm. And so in that, you gain some kind of an understanding or at least an assumption in your mind that it must not matter that much. Mm -hmm. And what they contributed couldn't have been that important if I don't need it to pass to the next grade, yeah. if I don't need it to actually say that I've gotten my diploma or my mm -hmm. degree, right? And so the lack is what motivates me to be able to say we are filling in this gap how you know it's a very very deep gap mm, it's a absolutely. huge like she said it's a voided chasm between this huge time of revolution and then we jump all the way even over it the war of 1812 yeah. we go all the way to the civil war mm -hmm. right then we jump all the way from that kind of dabble in reconstruction a little mm -hmm. bit but then you're right on to the war to end all wars right mm -hmm. and it's just like we measure time in war and in those great voided chasms no Nobody's doing anything, right? We don't have yeah. the names, we don't have the locations and the, the triumphs and the um, achievements of these people who were always fighting to be seen and always fighting to be counted in the same way. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, it's due to that lack that mm -hmm. it's just like, it's so important that we do that kind of work. That's why it's, you know, even if it's challenging, right? It couldn't have been as challenging as what they what they had to what go through to get us through. here. <laughs> exactly. To get us here. Exactly. So exactly. you know, the fact is, they all did that mm -hmm. so that we could have this conversation, yeah. so mm -hmm. that they would be remembered, and mm -hmm. so that we would be able to sit here and say we are Americans as well. Mm -hmm. You know, and the people that still kind of question that, the people that still kind of want to mm -hmm. know what your motivations yeah. are yeah. for simply saying that this is true. Yeah. For simply mm -hmm. saying that this is real yes. and that it's every bit as real as everything that you already think of when you think of patriotism, mm -hmm. when you think of America. It's just as real. Yes. Yeah, yeah, that this happened, um, that their lives are just as important. And by continuing to ignore and to not telling and to not tell that story, yeah. we're doing them a disservice yes. mm -hmm. and a disservice that continues after they're gone mm -hmm. and can't, can't speak for themselves. Because mm -hmm. I think about, you know, when I was a kid, history was my favorite subject, but it had nothing to do with anything at school. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It had everything mm -hmm. to do mm -hmm. yeah. with the history that I learned, um, you know, within my household growing up mm -hmm. of getting Ebony magazine and, and Jet magazine yes. and, and getting books you know, when I was a kid yes. about black scientists mm -hmm. and African kings and queens and, 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 and black inventors. So it's, it's, it's important, um, it's imperative yes. that we get these stories out there. Yes. Now, we, we have seen legislation come up recently here in Virginia, specifically House Bill number 781 that bans divisive concepts in school. And that's not the only bill like that, but that's the one here in Virginia that has received a lot of attention. A lot of these regulations specifically relate to black history, among other topics. Some of the proposed laws may not allow teachers to address some of the history that we teach every day. What is the impact of not talking about parts of history that make some people uncomfortable? We go back to neither seen nor heard and ignoring things that are part of the significant fabric of who we are as a nation. Mm -hmm. um, that fabric is tattered, it's torn, it's imperfect. And in its imperfection, we have a full picture of how people were treated, how they were spoken to, how they had to persevere, even though there are laws and social stigmas and taboos that keep them from persevering when you don't talk fully about history. We're not even going to talk about not repeating it. It's you don't know. Mm -hmm. These kids don't know where they come from. They don't know the sacrifices that people have had to make so that they could have the things that they have. And so when we don't talk about history, when we don't talk about everybody's part in history, you get an incomplete and skewed picture of history. And for some children, for them, if they don't see themselves mm -hmm. in history, mm -hmm. why should they make a point of trying to make history? Mm -hmm. There have been so many times I can recall that I've heard two specific phrases. Mm -hmm. I never learned that in school. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I never thought about it that way. Mm -hmm. 
the first one mm -hmm. specifically stands out to me because I we interact with people of all ages, of all mm -hmm. backgrounds, mm -hmm. come over from all over the world yes. mm -hmm. who say this to us. Mm -hmm. I never learned that in school. And me being of a certain generation, of a certain age, right, in many cases I'm speaking to my elder. Mm -hmm. And then of course there's me, and I never learned these things in school either. Yeah. So. Yeah. When it comes down to what we know about our history and how much is at stake for us to understand what had to happen in order for all of us to be yes. Yes. where we currently are, somebody had to have given so much yes. mm -hmm. to sacrifice so much, right? So how could it ever be that we need less? Mm -hmm. Yeah. taught mm -hmm. to us, that we need mm -hmm. less said about this subject? How could it ever possibly be the answer mm -hmm. to omit more, to mm -hmm. obscure more, to sweep more under the rug? Mm -hmm. How could that possibly be the answer? And what could it possibly harm us to know more about it if indeed that is why we can understand it's precious? Yeah. Mm -hmm. If that is why we can understand it's, it's worth fighting for? And I hear, I hear the same things you mentioned a lot too. Jeremy, I never learned that in school. Mm -hmm. I never thought about it this way. But I also hear a lot of, well, I thought this, but it was actually yeah. that. So it's like we're teaching this new information. We're teaching people to put themselves in other people's shoes. Mm -hmm. And sometimes we're teaching them that what they taught wasn't exactly, <laughs> exactly how it was or yeah. wasn't exactly um, the complete truth or sometimes wasn't wasn't the truth at all. Mm -hmm. So that's, yeah, yeah, very well said, both of you. Now, this legislation that we, we talked about um, is new, but this kind of approach to teaching history, is this new? <laughs> no, you're still dealing with, you know, in certain states uh, when the government controls who writes the textbooks, mm -hmm. when the writing of textbooks is politicized, or also who can put in the cheapest bid mm -hmm. for the textbook, mm -hmm. um, who is doing the research for the textbook. Mm -hmm. You can go all the way back into the late 1800s and you talk about these women who had no political power, but mm -hmm. they were the teachers during that time. And so many of them, especially in Virginia, are subscribing to the Lost Cause movement. Mm -hmm. So when they're writing these textbooks, they are writing for one specific side of history. Mm -hmm. It is not mentioning those whom they feel are outside the societal norms or acceptable to the history that they want to portray. And a lot of that history is going to be rewritten. It's going to be skipped. It's going to be ignored. We just got through, um, at least for me as a school teacher, having a conversation about the revamped um, standards of learning mm -hmm. for history in Virginia and seeing that some of the things that were put in there, they've been in there since like the 2000s. Mm -hmm. And folks have known, no, this is not correct. But look at how long it took them to correct it. When they first started talking about making those corrections, mm -hmm. my son was six months old. He's 22 now, and they've just gotten all those corrections in. So you're looking wow. at these textbooks, and you're looking at the perspective of the people who are writing the textbooks. And you're also looking at people who arbitrarily are walking to a classroom and say, I don't like the way you're saying that. Don't say it that way anymore and will use power and influence to keep educators from saying those things. And that is something that has happened ever since there's been a one room schoolhouse. Mm -hmm. If you're not privately teaching your child, if you send your child to a public institution, that public institution and the information within that public institution is controlled by what we call the stakeholders, parents, mm -hmm. legislators, members of the school board who look at what your child learns every day. And then the parents are like, well, I want to have a say 
in what my, my child is learning, then you're going to have to go to the school board. You're going to mm -hmm. have to talk to the legislature. You're going to have to be active in helping with that. But it's still one of those things where I have a parent that says, I don't want my child to learn about Jackie Robinson being discriminated against while he played baseball. You can mm -hmm. say, Mrs. Downs, oh, he was a great baseball player. He did this, he did that. But don't talk about the fact that other people made him feel bad mm -hmm. because it makes my child feel bad. And they don't need legislation for that. You have this single parent or groups of parents that will storm a school board meeting to tell everybody how wrong education is. Not because they are telling something that's not true, but because the truth is uncomfortable and they do have to face it. But unfortunately, the power of lobbying and having people who are specifically interested in keeping a certain type of history out of the history books is going to cause this subject to keep coming up over and over and over again. Mm -hmm. I'm um, always reminded of um, Brown versus the Board of Education mm -hmm. when you had these people told mm -hmm. that there's a certain way that you have to have your school now. Yes. Mm -hmm. You no longer can do the thing that we've been doing, keeping everybody separate. You have to you have to change, mm -hmm. right? And the people who were very resistant to that idea in all of its forms, mm -hmm. right, dragged their feet as much as they could. They, um, um, some of the language includes a phrase, with all deliberate speed. Mm -hmm. yeah. It means mm -hmm. that you can take your time in doing everything that you need to do to instill this change, mm -hmm. but you will do it, mm -hmm. right? And of course, they took that very, very, very literally mm -hmm. right, by the letter of the word, right? To say, we're gonna go as fast as we possibly can. But of course, this was in 54, you still have mm -hmm. these schools resisting this change in 1960 when a little girl named Ruby Bridges mm -hmm. had to take one of these aptitude tests first and foremost, yeah with which to even prove that mm -hmm. she had a mind worthy of educating mm -hmm. to these people yes. mm -hmm. around these other children. To which the response was, I will take my child out of school before I allow them to learn in the same room mm -hmm. with this little black girl. And the school year went like that where this one girl and this one teacher mm -hmm. had school yeah. amidst roaring mobs and, 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 and signs and spit and rocks and slurs hurled at this person mm -hmm. every single day. Her family was adversely mm -hmm. affected. Uh, her, her, her mother uh, couldn't even shop at the local grocery store. Mm -hmm. yeah. They wouldn't sell to her. I think her father lost his job. The thing about all of that, that you can decide that the education of your child is less important than who they are being educated with. Mm -hmm. This is one of the things that, with the whole picture is taught, mm -hmm. would likely be taught as a means by which to tell these children, this is the wrong thing to do. Mm -hmm. There's nothing right about mm -hmm. pulling your child, withholding an education mm -hmm. from your child for the express purpose to demonstrate hatred. Mm -hmm. That's wrong. It would be a valuable lesson to teach these children why that's wrong. Mm -hmm. But we speak on somebody like Ruby Bridges, and it's like I say that name and people can perk up and say, oh, I've heard of this, mm -hmm. right? Even if you don't know all the details, you've probably heard this name before. Mm -hmm. And we speak on these people in the 1960s as though they're these legendary moments in history. They're these great giants that live out in the hillside, mm -hmm. right, that we don't have to ever interact with. Ruby Bridges is still alive. Yeah, yeah. My mother was born the year before that happened. Yeah. She drank from segregated water fountains. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. My mother, right? Like mm -hmm. we are we yeah. are living in that we time. Are. We are living mm -hmm. in it. That's it. So even aside from uh, how legislation affects how someone teaches, mm -hmm. it can also affect who gets taught mm -hmm. and what lesson they are learning. That's it. 
because that's an education in and of itself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, none of those children had to be in a classroom to learn it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But they watched their parents. Yes. Yeah. Who are those people now? Because they're still around here too. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. So it's like that is an education within itself. What did the country learn from that? If not that it is very important, it's imperative that we understand why this was happening then mm -hmm. and why it can never happen again. But if we all of a sudden can't talk, talk about yeah. that yeah. because somebody's uncomfortable, you know who more than likely would be uncomfortable learning about something like that? But the fact remains that you're not looking at them, you're looking at the ones who feel as though somehow they inherit this guilt, yeah. which they don't. Mm -hmm. but exactly. Exactly. The fact is, if they don't know about it, and if it doesn't, mm -hmm. it's not real to them, yeah. if it's mm -hmm. not important to them, that that's not a thing that they ever need feel again, then they have a responsibility to, to fight for what is right. They have a responsibility to learn it so that it does not happen to anyone else. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's why we learn history, right? Mm -hmm. That's why everybody, you, you said the quote earlier, so that we do not repeat it, right? Everybody knows that quote. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Those who do not know it are doomed to repeat it. And why mm -hmm. is it always doomed? Why, it, of course, because we've made mistakes. Mm -hmm. Do we want to make them again? I hope not. Mm -hmm. That's right. And even though it's uncomfortable, it's not unsafe. Mm -hmm. Even though it's uncomfortable, it's not, not important. It's not able to be discarded. Mm -hmm. It's so mm -hmm. important that we all have that feeling mm -hmm. because that's what keeps us from wanting to go there mm -hmm. again. And it's, it's something that I think about a lot of the time. A lot of these things that happen are not that long ago. You know, Ruby Bridges is still alive. My mother, for the entirety of her, her schooling, um, went to segregated schools, you know, and the fact that with this not happening so long ago and the people who, who live these lives and live through this still mm -hmm. with us, but that there's danger of forgetting yes. is, is disconcerting, to say the least. Mm -hmm. Now, how do we move forward from here? Keep doing the same thing you do. Educate and agitate. <laughs> I'll be honest, educate mm -hmm. and agitate. Mm -hmm. We have to keep it moving. We have to demand mm -hmm. that these students get the education that they deserve. And, you know, I'm going to go back to my classroom on Monday mm -hmm. and we are going to, we're going to talk about being a human and how we are part of our community. And as part of our community, there are things in our community that are not right, that are mm -hmm. not fair. And what can we do to make things change? and starting them young and having those conversations when they're little because mm -hmm. children are old enough to understand. I saw a picture the other day saying that if Ruby Bridges was strong enough to go through what she went through, mm -hmm. then your six-year-old is, is strong enough to understand what happened to her mm -hmm. and why it happened and why we cannot let this happen again. And the other part is staying in that classroom and not being afraid mm -hmm. you know it's like I go in my room every day and turn on the lights and I know my kids are going to be in in about an hour or so and I'm thinking about okay how am I helping them to learn about where they came from and who they're going to be and how they're going to change the world I want them to be amazing people I want them to be strong people and I want them to be people that make history I want them to do those things and we just, we got to keep moving forward and we got to keep educating people and we can't be afraid to have those conversations, to have those hard conversations. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. John Lewis, the late, great John Lewis, mm -hmm. said, don't be afraid to get into good trouble. Yeah. <laughs> I don't mind. I don't, I don't mind, mind people it. being upset about mm -hmm. that, but understand how important it is. Mm -hmm. Understand that trying to shield yourself or anybody from what mm -hmm. happened yeah. it's the truth mm -hmm. what could what what do we benefit yeah. so you know i i don't have any intention to change how i do mm -hmm. what i do mm -hmm. um and you know before this we've we've yeah. gotten pushed back mm -hmm. before yeah. for doing what we do yeah it didn't take a law mm -hmm. 
it's just you know that's that is that is the natural consequence yes. of dealing with these situations. Mm -hmm. There are some people who learn, and there are some people who fight it. Yes. There are some people who resist it. There are some people who ignore it. There are some people who will do their very best mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. never have to engage with this, regardless yes. of what we do say or w how right it is, how truthful it is. It doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. So in that. Uh, it, like we always say, it can't be more daunting than it was mm -hmm. for those who came before mm -hmm. us. Mm -hmm. It's not that hard mm -hmm. yet. Mm -hmm. it ain't that hard mm -hmm. yet. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, you know, mm -hmm. but, you know, it is difficult. James Baldwin James said, you know, you keep saying the time, the progress, right? Mm -hmm. uh, my mother's time, my father's time, my grandmother's, my grandfather's time. Mm -hmm. How much time do you want for your progress? Right? Like, mm -hmm. it, yeah. but if we rest, if we stop, mm -hmm. If we pass the buck, mm -hmm. then they're gonna have to do it too. Yeah, yeah, and we could lose so much. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Well, thank you both for sharing your time to talk about this. Uh, turning now to the future, let's meet some students in Norfolk, Virginia, who have taken it upon themselves to share their experiences and feelings around race and racism by producing their own multimedia event. O2 came about um, in the context of, like, you know, the uh, recent emphasis on a race and racial dynamics in our community, like, at following like, the murder of George Floyd and everything. Um, a lot of organizations and activists were starting to, you know, like, emphasize the topic of race and racism. And Teens with a Purpose, we wanted to do something. We wanted to contribute to that discussion, and we wanted to do it in our own unique way. Working on this project has made me realize who I am and made me realize that there are lots of many people out there who are just like me and know where I'm coming from. O2 is specifically looking, it's not just looking at like racism, it's looking at um, the connection or lack thereof that the African diaspora have with their heritage. Um, you know, that loss of, you know, your identity and loss of like who you are and where your family comes from. O2 is a way for us to connect with the community. As teens, you know, a lot of opportunities to do that don't really come along. And because we are children, you know, hearing our voices, it's kind of like, huh? So with O2, we can be out there and we can say, this is what's happening. This is how we feel. It's a way for us to go out there and show everybody this is who we are. This is the way we break our silence. Not a lot of teenagers our age are willing to speak up and speak out about this topic and it's just a way that we are saying hey look we are not gonna step we are not gonna keep silent anymore we are stepping up in this ever ending fight against racism to my sisters and brothers i didn't know how your pain was then but now, but I know how it feels now. There are times when I feel stripped away from my home, like when I was forced to re relocate from my neighborhood, since now it's made out of broken communities that was once united. Like, um, I'm an artist and a poet and a musician, and working on this project to make me connect with my community in those ways, working on poetry, singing songs, even just playing my violin. All you have left are the memories the memories of my sisters and brothers, the memories of warm summer days and cool winter nights. Nevertheless, with the good memories come the bad ones, the ones we wish to forget, the memories of hate. I wish you didn't have to go through all the mess of others who don't see you like I do. I joined Teens with a Purpose last year and I joined them like uh, uh, while like, you know, writing and performing poetry and stuff. And uh, that was, and, I'm, I'm a writer, I love writing poetry and I love writing uh, stories and everything, but I wanted to take my writing further and, you know, delve into other fields like such as songwriting. And O2 allowed me to do that because I got to work on a song with, uh, my, with my friends and, you know, like produce something like um, that was out of my comfort zone a little bit. Uh, my family is from Egypt, so like North Africa, and, you know, it, being able to connect with like other African diaspora who like, while well, they have like different experiences than me, different history than I do, um, it was enlightening. It was uh, it really opened my eyes to like you know all the history that we don't know about and that isn't taught to us in school. I really never thought I will 
do something like this ever in my lifetime, but it just came naturally. I always thought like a voice to give back to my community and like, and then Ota came along and the next thing you know, I'm writing poetry, I'm writing, like I'm performing. I'm stepping on my console because this is something I never thought I'd be doing. I'm I'm just excited for what like what's what's to come. I I don't know what that looks like for Teens with a Purpose as a whole, but I'm excited to you know be with them and to continue working with them throughout like throughout the future. Um, well, a lot of the things you do here at TWP are thought of and made by the teens. So, um, working here, anything is possible. Thank you so much to Teens with a Purpose for sharing their inspiring project with us. Their next presentation of O2, The Healing Quilt, is this Saturday, February 26, both in person at the Chrysler Museum of Art and online. We've put a link in the comments for you to learn more. Across the country, there is increasing debate over what history should be taught in public school and how we should talk about uncomfortable topics like race and slavery. Some districts have banned books and made attempts to outlaw topics, which might make some students feel uncomfortable. But is this the best approach if we are to move forward and create a more just and equitable America? We encourage you to think about who your education is supposed to benefit. You, your parents, society as a whole, and depending on your answer, what parts of history do you think you should be learning about? We encourage you to use your voice and share your opinions with your school district and state representatives to try to make your school better. If you can't, then how can you work outside the school system to educate yourself and others about the full scope of American history? How will you help build a better future for the next class coming behind you.